Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and you might have noticed that there's something a little bit different about how I introduced myself if you've been following the show at all. And that's because on Saturday, I was actually ordained a deacon. So I'm Deacon Isaac now, and it was honestly one of the most beautiful days of my life. I was so happy, not going to lie. I was, I was crying just a little bit during, during the ceremony because I was just so overjoyed to be there with family and friends being consecrated to the Lord in a new way as a deacon. And one of the reasons that I share this with you at the beginning of this show is because the saint that I'm going to tell you about today was also a deacon. His name was St. Ephraim the Syrian, and he was born around the year 306 in a place called Nisibis, which is a city that is in modern-day Turkey. But in his time, it was part of the Roman Empire, which pretty much took up most of the known world at that point in history. Now, Ephraim was born into a pagan family. He wasn't born a Christian. His family worshipped many different gods and goddesses, and in fact, his family was very into their pagan religion because his father was a priest who served at the temple of a goddess named Abizal. So his family was very much rooted in this. His father worshiped in the temple and led others in sacrifices to this false goddess. And so Ephraim grew up with his family worshiping these false gods. He had no knowledge of the one true God, but instead followed after these false ones. But in his later teen years, someone actually took the time to share the gospel with him. He was evangelized and he was introduced to the faith of Christianity. He was told about the fact that there is only one God, not many, and that this one God created everything. And that this God had sent his son, Jesus, into our world had become a man himself. Jesus had become a man in order to rescue humanity from our sins. That because of our sin, we had separated ourselves from this God. We had separated ourselves from the one who had created us, who had loved us. And so we had earned death for ourselves. But Jesus had come into our world to die in our place on the cross so that we could rise with him. Because when Jesus rose again on the third day, we were all able to defeat death if we put our faith in him. And so this same God, Ephraim was told, is now calling all people to turn to him, to believe in his son Jesus, to turn their lives over to Jesus as Lord in order to be saved. And so Ephraim, when he, when he heard this, he believed this. Even though he had been raised as a pagan, following after false gods, he believed these words and he decided to become a Christian. Now, this caused a lot of tension in his house because, remember, his dad was a pagan priest. How do you think he felt about the fact that his son wanted to leave their religion and become a Christian? In fact, when I was reading about the life of St. Ephraim, I found out that one of the earliest sources on his life said that his father was so angry with Ephraim that he kicked him out of the house. So a lot of conflict in the family. And yet Ephraim stayed true to his convictions. Even though it was difficult, even though he felt like he was disappointing his family, which would be hard for anyone, he realized that he had to stay true to Jesus, who he had fallen in love with, who he had believed in. Now, before Ephraim could be baptized as a Christian, he had to get trained in what Christians actually believed. He had to take classes on the Catholic faith. And the classes at that time were being taught by the bishop, the Bishop of Nisibis, who was a man called James. He's actually a saint himself, St. James, so maybe I'll do a show on him later. But St. James became good friends with young Ephraim while he was teaching him about the faith. And they remained friends even after Ephraim finished his instruction and he was baptized around the age of 18. Now, shortly after his baptism, Bishop James invited Ephraim to become one of his deacons, to continue to help him build up the church in the area. And so Ephraim agreed and eventually was ordained a deacon. Now, Deacon Ephraim helped his friend, Bishop James, in many different things, but he was especially focused on leading the people in the area in living a moral and holy life, leading them to become closer to God. And this was no easy task. I mean, it's never an easy task, but it was especially difficult for Ephraim because the community in Nisibis was a very diverse crowd. 
It was very diverse ethnically. It was very diverse religiously. There was Arabs and Greeks and Jews and Persians and Romans all living together in the same city. And so that basically meant that Ephraim didn't really have, you know, a one size fits all approach that he could use to lead his people closer to Jesus. He had to work with them on an individual level and meet them where they were at. And much like people nowadays, the people of Ephraim's time struggled with a lot of sinful things that Ephraim had to help them overcome. There were people who were struggling with greed, people who were struggling with impurity, people who were struggling with being lazy, with gossiping about their neighbors, hating those even in their own family. And so first and foremost, Ephraim started with the basics and he started to work on converting people away from their former religions, away from their false gods to follow the one true God, just like he had when he was a teenager. He taught them how to put their faith in the Lord Jesus as the son of God. And then when they were Christians, you know, the work wasn't over just yet. He had to teach them even further, lead them closer to God by living a life of holiness. He taught them how to turn away from their sins, to seek God's mercy, to break patterns of toxic behavior in their life so that they could become more and more like Jesus. And so if someone who he was teaching was greedy, he would tell them that they needed to practice the opposite virtue. He said, look, if you are struggling with greed, then maybe what you need to do is give away some of your money to the poor. Give away some of your money to the church to help you fight that. If someone was struggling with laziness, he would tell them, well, look, you need to sacrifice some of your time. You need to give of yourself to serve someone else or spend more time praying. Give more of your time to God to teach yourself how to not be lazy. And so he worked very hard to lead all of the Christians in the city, no matter their background, in a life of holiness so that they could free themselves from the sinful patterns in their life and become saints. Now, as if this work wasn't hard enough, Deacon Ephraim also had to deal with a lot of political turmoil that was happening in his region. Because the Roman Empire, which Nisibis was a part of, actually withdrew their protection from the city. And that left the city open to invasion from the outside. And one of the entities outside of the empire that was very interested in that region was the Persians. And so at three different points, the city of Nisibis was under attack, was under siege from the Persians who wanted to take them over. And during these times of siege, which as you can understand would be traumatic for anyone going through it, Deacon Ephraim did not abandon his people. He encouraged the terrified citizens. He would pray with them and help them to look forward with hope to the joys of heaven because in the midst of all the horrors of war that they were experiencing in this life, Ephraim was showing them that, look, this world isn't the end. We as Christians are living for the future reality, the afterlife where we get to be with God forever. So take courage, take hope, and don't lose your trust in God. Eventually, the Persians did conquer the city and they began to rule over that area. And this was a very scary reality for the Christians because the king of the Persians, a man named Shapur II, he was a pagan man. He followed the religion of his people and they worshipped a variety of things, including fire and the stars and the sun and the moon. Uh, their religion saw the beauty of the stars, saw the beauty of the planets, but instead of recognizing their beauty and worshiping the creator, the God who made this beauty, they were dazzled and wrongfully started worshiping the things he'd created. They worshiped the sun and the moon as if they were gods instead of being created by God. And so this Persian king distrusted Christians. He thought that they were a threat to his empire. And so he made drastic moves to persecute them fiercely. First, he raised their taxes. Then he began to take away their property before finally moving to a stage where he was arresting, torturing, and even executing people just for the supposed crime of following Jesus. And so as a result of this persecution, most of the Christians from the Nisibis region fled. They left everything behind, their houses, all of their belongings, and they fled 
to a city called Edessa, which was much safer. And Ephraim wouldn't leave his people behind. And so he became a refugee with them. And they all fled to Edessa. And Edessa is where Deacon Ephraim would spend the rest of his life ministering to the people. And in his new ministry in Edessa, Deacon Ephraim faced new problems because there were several false teachers in the area of Edessa that were proposing false views of Christianity that were really confusing people and leading them astray, honestly, from the true Christian faith. One of these false teachers was a priest named Bardasanes. And Bardasanes, even though he was a Catholic priest, he didn't always act like it because he tried to bring in faith elements from Babylonian paganism into Christianity. And one of these pagan practices that he was trying to fuse into Christianity was astrology. Astrology, if you haven't heard of that before, is basically uh, studying the movements of stars and planets because you believe that they have some kind of magical impact on your life. So people who look at horoscopes or people who look at the movement of the stars and planets and try and figure out how it's going to affect their lives, that's astrology. And so Bardasanes was teaching people that the stars were actually living beings and that by studying the stars, you could find signs in the sky that would tell you your fate and your luck and your destiny. So Bardasanes was very effective at leading people into his false teachings. And one of the things that he would do to spread his message was to write catchy songs and poems about his beliefs. It kind of sounds weird to us nowadays, but it was very effective. And he would teach these songs to people as a way of spreading his beliefs about astrology. Now, Deacon Ephraim knew that the stars had no magical power over the lives of humans. He knew that Bardasanes was wrong to try and incorporate astrology into Christianity. He knew that the stars were not God themselves, but they were created by God, that only God knows the future and can answer prayers. Because Ephraim had read his Bible. And in the Bible, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 27, Daniel the prophet says this, he says, no wise man, no enchanters or magicians or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And so from this, Deacon Ephraim knew that only God knows the future and can answer our prayers, not the stars. And that if people were falsely assigning divine powers to things in the heavens like the sun and the moon, astrology actually became a kind of idolatry because they were making an idol, making a false god out of something that wasn't God. And so Deacon Ephraim went to work teaching the people, don't be led into false worship of stars. Don't be led into astrology. There's no place for this kind of magic and mixing of religions in Christianity. And not only would Deacon Ephraim debate the teachings of Bardasanes, but he would actually flip his songwriting on him. He had this ingenious way of taking songs written by Bardasanes and then rewrite them with true Catholic teaching. And sometimes he would even just go ahead and write a better song and replace it altogether. And Ephraim's music was so beautiful, both in music, in the, the harmonies and the melodies, and in the words that they were sung in churches, they were sung in convents, and even by Christians in the street. And so people were actually being won back to the true faith through his songs. They were leaving behind their sinful practices of astrology and returning to true, simple Christianity. And so throughout his time in ministry, Deacon Ephraim became quite famous for writing thousands of songs, not just against false teachings, but many other songs he wrote on truths of the faith, on poetic prayers, and his songs of praise to God were so beautiful that they earned him a nickname. People loved his music so much that they began calling him by the nickname Harp of the Holy Spirit. Because Deacon Ephraim was like a harp, like a musical instrument that the Holy Spirit was playing and inspiring and creating these beautiful songs for the church. Ephraim also wrote many long papers explaining the scriptures to people. 
drawing out the beauty of the Bible, making it easier for people to understand. Again, because he wants to direct them in how to become holy. Now, when he was in his 60s, Deacon Ephraim went through another crisis because a terrible plague swept through the city of Edessa and it began taking the lives of many of the people who were falling ill. And so Deacon Ephraim, he had a choice. He could have run away from the sickness, run away from everyone in order to save himself, but that's not the kind of guy Deacon Ephraim was. He was someone who jumped into action and he was running around the city, tending to the sick, praying with them, helping them to draw closer to God in the last moments of their lives and helping to bury the dead who had succumbed to the disease. And eventually Ephraim too caught the plague and he died leaving the people of Edessa behind, mourning the loss of their beloved deacon. Now, after his death, Deacon Ephraim was recognized for the brilliance of his writings in defending the faith of the church. And so he was honored both in the eastern and western parts of the church with the title Doctor of the Church. And that's a very high honor. There's not too many people that have received this honor of being a doctor of the church. And basically that means that Deacon Ephraim's writings were not just valuable for the people of Edessa, but that his teachings are valuable in every age for all Christians, even for us nowadays. And I couldn't help but agree. I think that Deacon Ephraim's wisdom is certainly needed in our day, especially his warnings about the dangers of trying to mix any kind of paganism with Christianity. And I know that that is happening nowadays because I have experienced it. When I was nine years old, my parents signed me up for a summer camp in town. And we would go to the library and we would do art projects. You know, it was like something to keep the kids busy during the summer. And one day while I was at this summer camp, the teachers at the camp, the counselors, taught us all about horoscopes. And they told us that depending on what time of the year we were born, that the stars had something to say about our personality and about our futures. And I remember even as a nine-year-old that something about that just didn't sound right. And so I went to my parents and told them, and my parents are awesome Catholics, and they were quick to tell me, Isaac, you're absolutely right. Christians don't do that. Christians have nothing to do with horoscopes and astrology because we believe that God is all powerful, that God is the one who holds our future, not the stars, not the planets or anything like that. And so astrology wasn't just around in the time of Ephraim. It's still very popular today and many people are being led astray by it. Just a little while ago on social media, I saw an old work friend inviting people to come onto her live stream so that she could tell them their futures by looking at the movements of the stars and by doing tarot card readings for them. I had another friend also on social media who was selling charms that she claimed she had soaked in the power of the moon and that these charms now had power to protect your house from bad energy. And people were jumping in. They were jumping into the comments. They were asking for their futures to be told. And they were asking how much these charms were so that they could protect their house. Because they really believed that the stars had an impact, a magical impact in their lives. Our culture today is full of this. It's all around us. All these different ways to try and know the future, which is basically uh, something called divination. It's trying to figure out or predict the future, trying to have control over your life through magical powers like charms or spells or studying the stars. And none of this is able to be held by Christians. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2116, we read this. It says, all forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or any other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. That includes horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpretation of omens and lots, the phenomena of clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums. And the Catechism says the reason these aren't allowed is because they all conceal a desire for power, power over time, history, and even other human beings, as well 
as a wish to conciliate hidden powers. And then the catechism says this, these things all contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. And this makes sense. The catechism is right that Christians can't take part in any of this occult practice because all of these things take away from the honor and worship that we owe only to God. We don't owe worship to stars. We don't owe time to fortune tellers or new age charms or Ouija boards or anything like that. Now, maybe you're listening and thinking to yourself, come on, come on, Deacon Isaac. Aren't you taking this all a little bit too seriously? It's not like doing any of this stuff is actually dangerous. Well, how dangerous is it? Because any kind of magical or superstitious game or activity that proposes to have power to tell the future or bring you good luck, well, where is that power coming from? It's certainly not coming from God. God doesn't need cards or crystal balls or potions to answer prayer. In fact, God forbids all of this stuff, both in scripture and through the teaching of his church. So who is behind these powers? Well, the answer is demons, fallen angels, dark spirits. They're real. They have real power and they are allowed to impress people to trick them with weak magic tricks in order to deceive people, lie to them and lead them away from God. And that is exactly what's happening in all of these new age and astrological activities that people are getting trapped in. Now, don't get me wrong, people normally don't set out to be harmed by evil spirits when they take part in these activities, but they're tricked into it. I had a friend, a priest, who once had to pray with a family who had bought a potion from a witch and given it to their daughter as a way of blessing her. They thought that they were doing something good for her, but then their daughter became incredibly sick. And the priest had to pray deliverance prayers with that child in order for her to be healed. And so these things can indeed be very dangerous. Well, you might be listening and thinking, well, Isaac, don't worry. I don't actually believe in any of this. I'm just doing it for fun. Well, to that, I would say, if you think it's just fun, then why are you doing it? Most people don't do things for no purpose whatsoever. And I do think that People that are engaging in these activities, they do believe in it a little bit or else you wouldn't do it at all. So someone's saying, you know, I don't believe in astrology, but hey, you know, I'll check my horoscope every once in a while. And if the stars say it's a lucky day, well, maybe that will influence what I do because you never know. Maybe it's true just in case. And so there's always an element of some belief. And even if there truly is no belief whatsoever in what you're doing, Here is is kind of a sobering truth. You don't have to believe in the dark powers behind some of these things in order for demons to harm you through them. I had a friend who was with a group of other friends and they were playing with a Ouija board, a well-known occult game. And in the midst of the game, they were trying to talk with whatever spirit was behind this Ouija board. And one of the friends asked the, the board, Prove to us that you're real. And as soon as he said this, there was two candles on the table and the flames leapt out of the candle and burned two little marks up on the ceiling, which obviously candles can't do by themselves. But there was a demon behind that board that was trying to impress the kids who were playing with this game. They were all teenagers at the time. And my friend, when she told me this story, she said it was one of the scariest moments in my life. Now, she didn't believe in demons when she was playing with that game. And yet that demon was able to show himself precisely because they were dabbling. They were playing with one of his activities. Now, with all of these stories, I don't want to inspire fear in you. I don't want you to leave this show looking for demons around every corner. But like Deacon Ephraim, I do want to warn you. I want to warn you in joining in any activity that seeks supernatural power in anything else other than God. We don't need any of that as Christians because we worship a God who is not only all powerful, but a God who loves us, a God who wants the best for us, a God who is a father 
to us. And so we can pray to him directly for any of our needs. We can trust in him to provide for us. Magic and the occult tries to control the world. It tries to control our future. But prayer is different because it allows God to be God. It allows him to be in control. And we humbly ask him for his help in his timing. He knows the future. He can heal our diseases. He can protect our families. He wants to bless us. He wants to love us. So don't waste your time with false pagan practices, astrology, new age, none of that stuff that could open you up to evil spirits who just want to harm you, who just want to lure you away from God with lies to make you feel like you're in control or just having fun. You don't need that. Just go straight to God who loves you. And so with all of that in mind, let's pray now to Saint Ephraim that we would become saints just like he was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Ephraim, you taught your people to avoid the dangers of astrology and not to mix any pagan practices into Christianity. And so help us to imitate you in being watchful over what we get involved with, avoiding anything from the occult or the new age that could take us away from giving God the worship and honor that he alone deserves. St. Ephraim, you used music to lead people closer to God. So help us to seek out beautiful Christian music that in turn lifts our hearts up to God, that trains us to sing praise to him throughout the day and help us to build that praise into our schedule. And St. Ephraim, you served the church as a deacon by serving your people even when it was a risk to your health and eventually even though it cost you your life. And so through your intercession, I pray right now for deacons all over the world. And selfishly, I ask for prayers for myself as a new deacon. I'll take the extra prayers any chance I can get that all deacons would imitate you in loving the people that we are called to serve and be willing to sacrifice everything for our flock so that they can become saints. St. Ephraim the Syrian, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.